I'm here with David Mercer, CEO of LMAX Exchange, and we're here to discuss the sort of evolution of the sort of multi-dealer environment and um, some of the sort of specifics of the LMAX Exchange. David, thank you. Um, first of all, in such a competitive space as the sort of multi-dealer platform environment, the, LC, the ECN environment, how easy is it for you to differentiate LMAX Exchange? I think the differentiation is clear. Um, that comes from the quality and consistency of execution. That comes from exchange style trading on the MTF. Um, you know, with the MTF, you get complete pre and post trade transparency, an anonymous open uh, limit order book, which is backed by superior technology. Uh, we idle at around 11,000 orders per second, and we have execution speed around three milliseconds. The ultimate benefit to their client is their cost of trading reduces, and they become more profitable. However, in terms of taking that message out there, it's very much an experiential product. Um, the difficult bit is getting people to experience it, to try it. Once they do, they don't leave. I think I've got the highest retention rate I've ever had. Certainly, over 90% of the brokers we, acqu we acquired last year are still trade with us. So for me, it's a bit like the iPad. When it first came out, people were sort of saying, why do I need that? Um, I've got a laptop, I've got a netbook. And the answer was, just try it. It's better. You know, another analogy would be Yahoo and Google. They say they do the same yeah. thing, but Google wins just because it's better. The experience is superior. So for me, the differentiation is clear, but we have to be better at spreading the word and getting clients to experience the superior execution they crave. What, what sort of market segment are you targeting then to actually sort of, everybody needs a point of entry in the foreign exchange market. Where do you come in and where do you sort of look to branch out from? So I think we're squarely now targeting the institutional space, uh, but there's certainly a crossover into the, what people might call the retail market. We don't target that market directly, yeah. we, we target retail brokers. So effectively liquidity provision to retail brokers, and then we deliver that flow straight through to market makers and liquidity providers. And retail brokers are actually quite demanding, as I know that you can you confirm. Very. <laughs> Which helps, I guess, if you are actually looking to build then into that institutional space, because yeah, it's, you've got to have a good grounding. Yeah, I mean, that's our, the sweet spot for us. You know, we sort of relaunched the business uh, 18, 20 months ago. That was the best place for us to start. Mm. What we're seeing now is more traction from money managers, funds, and pro traders. Yeah. So we need to grow. We need to evolve. Uh, we need to, as always, you know, add liquidity, um, add depth, accommodate uh, sort of bigger size trading and move into the more grown-up institutional space. And I think we're making headway. Yeah. One of the biggest issues we're facing in this industry now is yeah, the increase of rejection rates, uh, the ubiquitous liquidity mirage. Last look obviously is a big part of this. Now, what's your view on last look in, in the foreign exchange market? So our view is pretty clear. There's no long-term future. Uh, it's in our rule book. Uh, there's no last look as standard. And that's applied uniformly to all our general members uh, who are the liquidity providers. The argument out there is that um, some providers, some liquidity providers, insist on last look. Apart from a very few, I don't think it's true. Um, we currently have 10, we've got two large banks coming on the next quarter. Of course, the first thing they ask is, do we get last look? Our answer is no. But what they do insist on is an ability to protect themselves. Uh, we provide that protect protection uh, by allowing them to update their pricing more quickly than in any other venue. And we police clients. So yeah. clients aren't coming on just to game the market. So as a wider FX industry, we're ultimately client facing. And you've got to look at the experience from a buy side customer. With last look, that, ex that experience sometimes can be dreadful. Rejections, requotes, at exactly the most important time that a client wants to trade. And it almost seems discriminatory, although it isn't. It's applied across all clients. But the client just wants to trade. So I think if we want to grow the business um, collectively, we need to show people that the execution style on FX can match what, what happens in, a, in other asset classes. The history is that you know, Last Look was a business solution to a technology problem. And I think that's right because there was an unlevel playing field at that stage. Yeah. Buy side got their market data quicker, they had sharper algos, and quite often they beat the LPs to, to the punch. But I think that advantage now has been mostly eroded. Um, so now there's no need for it on a clean, fast, transparent venue. You know, my message to other venues, rather than the liquidity providers is, 
you know, take it away. Give your customer, give the buy side a better experience. But to do that, you've got to enhance your technology uh, and your onboarding process yeah. to offer a level playing field to the liquidity providers because ultimately they're the bedrock of the industry. It strikes me that within that scenario then you have to be very stringent at, at actually making sure people adhere to the rules so that you can actually create that level playing field. You mean from the buy side perspective? Or? From, from any user of the platform, but yeah, particularly those that may be liquidity takers. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, but you know, when we look back in time and we looked at how FX started to be gained, you've talked about it a lot before. I mean, where's the long-term value in those strategies? Yeah. Um, so yes, we're stringent. Yes, you come on, you tell us what your strategy is. There's a few clients that we've had in the last year, but only a few, literally a handful that haven't been acceptable because what maybe seemed to be sharp on another venue isn't sharp on our venue. Yeah. Um, so, and we tell these clients, you know, you're a smart guy, you're a mathematician, uh, you've come up with a great model to arb across venues or beat an LP to, to the punch. There's no future in that. Yeah. And yeah. there's no future in FX going forward for that type of strategy. There's enough other strategies that you can engage with. So looking then at, um, with all this in mind, what's your view on where the, the FX industry goes in the next two to three years? What do you think will be? Ahead from here, that's for sure. Um, one, would hope, one would really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now look, I think, I think it's a really exciting time. People have been, had their heads down a little bit about the drop in volumes in, in 2012. I would like to say, of course, that was our growth, period, growth time. Um, but look, it, the industry's going to expand in terms of volume and activity. Uh, FX is moving from principally rate-driven to credit-driven. There's more and more traders, investors looking at FX as a core strategy rather than just a byproduct or uh, supplementary risk management. Um, and I think you're going to see a lot more flow, obviously, from the uh, emerging economies. People talk about China and India, but they're just countries right now. But yeah. they're, they're waking up to it and they've got greater market access now. Um, the thing I think we have to realise as an industry is that these New markets and these new traders don't pay any attention at all to the current ecosystem. What they expect is execution and service. We talked earlier about service, that they can access in other asset classes. So, you know, the liquidity providers, the venues need to evolve, innovate, provide a better service to this new breed of client. Um, I think there's going to be the obvious challenges in the FX market still. So, you know, algo execution is just going to go north from here. So somebody mm -hmm. quoted recently at 60%. Well, you know, it could be 70%, 80%. Yeah. That's not all bad. It's just a demand for precise, effective execution. And you're thinking algo execution as, as opposed to the algo, the algo trading strategies, which would include high frequency. Yeah, up. I mean, I think everyone lumps it all in the same bucket. You know, high frequency is mm -hmm. bad. I don't think that's the case. No. You know, I sat in a few panels this year um, with, with a couple of large funds who said, look, I'm not using it to game the market. I'm not holding positions for milliseconds or even seconds. I just want precise, accurate execution. And I think that's the way the market's going. And I mean, you go the whole range, the whole, the whole spectrum. You go to the top end of the funds, this is how they're executing, um, across venues, and everyone knows what's happening there. Right down to the guys on the low end with expert advisors trading on MT4. It's just what's going to happen. You know what your entry point is, and the best way to do that is via computer now, mm -hmm. um, rather, than, rather than point and clicking. So... It's going to be effective execution for all. I think the, the gaming, the ability to game it, is decreasing. That opportunity is decreasing anyway. Yeah. Uh, but as venues, we all need to be able to, to accommodate that because it's just going to grow. Okay, so then just, just finally, um, to put you on the spot, <laughs> where do you want LMAX to be in two, three years' time in this industry? I think that's clear. I mean, certainly we need to be in the top two or three venues in all FX segments. So by that volume. includes... By oh, volume. Yeah. And hopefully, bottom line, I mean, I think what comes with that is it's we should be more efficient than some of the incumbents because, you know, we're new, we're fresher, technology's new, and we haven't got the legacy and the overhead. So the bottom line should be there as well. Yeah. Um, but certainly, our goal isn't just to be number two and number three in the institutional space, we want to be in the top three in institutional and interbank. Um, and in a five-year time horizon, I don't see any reason why we can't be number one. Mm. Um, 
I think if we look around at the rest of the market, you know, no business is too big to fail and no business is too small to succeed. Business as usual isn't going to work in FX, same as any other industry. Yeah. Right? Remember, remember Blockbusters, remember Borders, remember Polaroid, remember Kodak? So I think the option's there for, for all of us, and that's the challenge for all of us, is to, to compete, uh, to innovate, to deliver a better service, and you know, it will be survival of the fittest, and I think we've got it set up to, to be one of the fitter ones. Great, David, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.